a warm welcome to Glasgow <coughs> College of Union University. My name is Andrea Nelson. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at uh, the University. It's my great pleasure as part of my job to introduce these lectures, but I have some very important things before we get to the main event, such as turning phones to silent. Um, just checking you know where the fire exit is. We do not have any planned fire alarm tests. Fire alarm here and at the back. And there are some ladies and accessible toilets out this way. For accessibility, you go round and round the lecture theatre and some gentlemen's toilets there. We are inviting you to join us for some refreshments and networking, or if you prefer, networking and refreshments <laughs> after the uh, lecture this evening in the George Moore uh, Lecture Theatre, which is up left. And follow everybody else because they will be going to the same place. Now, these professorial lectures are a real highlight in the university calendar. It reflects the public role of universities and for Glasgow Caledonian as University for the Common Good. It's about sharing our research which has a wider impact on society, whether that's locally, nationally or internationally. But they're also a fantastic opportunity for recently promoted professors to showcase their work in an accessible way to colleagues, research partners, and of course, family and friends. It's great to see you all here, um, especially mum, um, partner Roy, <coughs> mum and dad-in-law, and <coughs> children Dylan, Milo, Autumn, Stan, and Theo. So a warm welcome to all of you. And this is, it's really hard for me, this bit, because my job really is to stand up, speak up, and shut up, <laughs> and um, give way to Nancy. But I just wanted to say a few words of introduction. I'm sure she will expound upon these as she goes through her lecture this evening. Because this is a very personal thing, a professorial lecture. It really, you bring a lot to it. But Nancy was born and grew up in Burnley, Lancashire, and was politically motivated from a very early age, almost being expelled from school the year before being voted head girl. <laughs> <laughs> After being the first in her um, family to go to university at um, a place down the, down the road, I think called Glasgow in its name as well, and she came to GCU to do her PhD. And after going away for a bit, which is great, she came back to do her PhD. So it's fantastic to see one of our PhD students um, gain her, her justified promotion to professor. Her career has taken her all over the world to contribute to policy and to the ongoing conversations about addressing gender-based violence. She leads the Gender Research and Equalities Network here at GCU and her work has um, continues to have huge reach. She currently co-leads an EU-funded project to um, develop innovative solutions to eliminate domestic abuse across nine countries, and very recently won Outstanding Woman Researcher in Sociology at an international award ceremony in India. And it says here, outside of work. <laughs> but um, I'm told that outside of work, she has a huge number of um, interests in supporting an inclusive dance group based in Glasgow, school parent-teacher council, after school club, and boot camper of the year 2022. <laughs> <laughs> her heart, of course, is happiest when she's surrounded by her family in a tent. And um, <laughs> I'm sure there will be more discussions about how those times in the tent have led to inspiration. And um, we're delighted to welcome you to your professorial lecture. Nancy, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm quite overwhelmed, I'll be honest. 
Um, but I'm absolutely delighted to see so many friendly faces here today. So thank you, everybody, for, for making the effort to come along. I'm really touched. Just to give a content warning, um, I'm going to be talking about themes of violence, victimisation and abuse, which some may find distressing, so if you need to leave, please do. There's also some contact agencies at the end of the lecture. Um, today I'm going to talk about my journey to get here, um, my contribution in part to gender-based violence research, and um, those who helped to hold up the sky, many of you um, in here are those and also a postscript, which we'll leave for the end. This is Mary. Mary met Frank when she was 18. <coughs> she ran away with Frank when she was pregnant, and she got married. She had Francis at 19, Carol at 20. Her third baby, a boy, died. She then had Pat. Mary lived with domestic abuse all of her adult life until her death, aged 57. She had three years where she lived alone with her daughters when Frank was in prison for armed robbery. She described those three years as the happiest and most carefree time of her life. Mary was my grandma, my grandma Mary. Her children were my aunties and my mum. I grew up in Burnley, Lancashire, a large working class industrial town in the north of England. I grew up in a very matriarchal family with my great grandma, my grandma, my aunties, my mum and my cousin living within the same three streets just off Burnley Road. I remember when I first studied sociology in my A-levels, I recognised those communities described by Wilmot and Young in their 1950s study of East End London. For me, that described the 1980s Burnley, a world rich in social relationships, networks of dependence and mutual support that were central to people's resilience in facing the adversity of insecure and low paid employment and often a lack of opportunities. My dad was the only person I knew who wasn't from Burnley. I don't remember my mum and dad being together, but I always remember them being friends. They both brought me up and supported me to become the person I am today. I want to acknowledge them both to say thank you. My mum is here, thank you mum, and I wish that my dad could be too. They're very different people, but I got something from each of them. My dad was very calm, and not one for conflict, but believed resolutely in community and spent much of his life helping others. My mum always helped children who didn't have what other children had. She was a passionate advocate and she helped me cultivate that argumentative side of me. <laughs> when the head teacher at my high school would call my mum yet again to tell her that I started another petition, <laughs> organised another city or written yet another letter of complaint to the local education authority, her first question would be, well, does she have a point? Does she have a reason? And then she'd leave me to it, knowing full well that I could find my own battles. Both my parents instilled in me a love of reading. On a Saturday, my dad would take me to Burnley Library, and whilst he looked at the records, he'd leave me reading for hours. Sometimes, if he was feeling flush, he'd take me to buy a book from Smith's, and I'd have finished it by the time my mum picked me up on a Sunday afternoon. Reading gave me an insight into a world beyond my own, different ways of living, of thinking, of loving, of the adventures but also the mundane. I loved reading about how lives unfolded, the catalyst where one choice changes the course of a life. I remember when I was around 11 telling my mum I was ill so I could stay off school to finish Wuthering Heights. <laughs> my, mom, my, teachers, sorry, my teachers encouraged me to apply to go to university. The only reference I had for that was old bearded men on BBC Two early morning Sundays talking about protons on the old university. <laughs> but I wanted a chance to leave Burnley. I was the first and to date the only person in my family to go to university. 
And luckily, this was back in the time when even England had free education. I got a grant and decided to apply to the furthest place from Burnley that I could. Welcome to Scotland. <laughs> I arrived in Glasgow ready to study English literature. This was the first time, other than Mallory Towers, that I'd ever encountered anyone who'd been to private school. And also, to be fair, the first time I'd ever met anyone who was Scottish. <laughs> one day, early in the term, I was in a tutorial in one of the tiny rooms in the cloisters. There was a group of maybe 12 of us, and the professor asked a question about the book, The Let, brilliant, the Brontes. I loved it, I'd read it, I was ready and confident. I was nervous, but gave a really detailed answer. The professor looked around everyone to galvanise favour. Then repeated my answer back, but in an exaggerated northern accent. Not in a kind way, but done to humiliate and embarrass me. <coughs> I sat there for the rest of the class, bright red, with tears in my eyes, willing myself not to cry. After the class, I walked out, I dropped English literature, and I continued my degree in sociology, where I was taught and inspired by many wonderful lecturers, and I met one of my best friends. And here I am. I want to talk about the work I've done and the contribution that I've made to sociology, to gender and violence research and policy work here in Scotland. When I talk about gender, I talk about those socially constructed roles, those behaviours, positions, responsibilities and expectations that are ascribed differently to men and boys and women and girls. And these inform ideas of how we're meant to behave and how we're meant to act. When we talk about violence, violence can take many forms. It can be legally sanctioned or condemned with various intentions or motives. It can be powerful, political, accidental, have repercussions and retaliation. It can involve a myriad of behaviours and a multitude of consequences physical injuries, emotional abuses, personal sexual violations, or material deprivations. I was interested when I first began learning about violence in feminist consciousness. I knew all about class consciousness. Sociology lecturers always talked about Marx, so I knew about class consciousness, but feminist consciousness was something different. I hadn't realized that all of these feelings, these experiences of being a girl and being a woman, these personal experiences were all part of the bigger picture. Welcome to the patriarchy. Before I started high school, my mum met Dave and we moved up the road to an old farmhouse. It was in a valley and the surrounding houses, there were eight boys who lived there, about the same age as me. In the summer before I went to high school, I spent every day with this group of boys, building dens, camping, sliding down hills in an old tin bath that we found, just hanging out and dossing. What a laugh we had. I knew we wouldn't all go to the same high school, but they'd all be on the same school bus with me. I felt renewed, I felt relieved that I'd known people on the bus and that I could sit with them and have someone to talk to. That first morning of high school, I got on the bus and went to sit at the back. What are you doing? They acted like they didn't know me. You, you can't sit here. This is reserved for the lads, not you. Go and sit at the front. I went to sit in the front and they didn't believe it. As more boys got on, the more I was jeered and shouted at. Insults about how I looked and sexual slurs. When one shouted, another shouted louder. It went on every day. I thought these boys were my friends. A few months later, we got a new bus driver, early 20s, good looking, really chatting. He shouted at them to stop. He was older than them, he had more power. I sat at the front and enjoyed the peace, but I also enjoyed the attention I was getting from Simon, the driver. He was so interested in me, what I liked, what I watched on TV. We chatted all the way home. He started asking me to stay on the bus and he doubled back to drop me off. I couldn't believe that he was paying me all this attention. It felt really special. He started parking the bus so we could sit and talk. He told me about a course he was doing at college. 
Maybe I could help him with it. It was a massage course. Maybe he could show me. It was probably better though if I took my top off. I was 12. And it's this feminist consciousness that's enabled me to make sense and to understand and to interpret not just this experience, but every experience that many of the women here today will have had throughout their lives. This multitude of other experiences that have informed and impacted my life as a girl and my life as a woman. After graduating from Glasgow, I worked three jobs to fund a master's in Essex, and after that I got my first graduate job. I was a research assistant at Keele University in Staffordshire, the only six months that Alton Towers wasn't open. <laughs> <laughs> in 2000, the Scottish Executive adopted a gender-based definition of domestic abuse. This meant for the first time gender equality was recognised by the state as providing the context within which domestic abuse occurs. It was groundbreaking, but also controversial, and consequently was challenged from the outset by those claiming that domestic abuse was gender neutral. So the research was commissioned by the Scottish Executive to examine the prevalence and seriousness of domestic violence perpetrated against men, to look at the perspectives of male victims and the adequacy of the available services, and I was part of that team. So the Scottish Crime Safe Survey had shown that a higher number than expected of men had said that they'd experienced domestic abuse. However, we went back and spoke to these 31 men and we retraced them and re-interviewed them. And we found evidence of misinterpretation of what they were being asked in the original survey. So a lot of the men who said that they'd experienced domestic abuse had in fact experienced vandalism or property crime or burglary. They hadn't actually experienced domestic abuse from the partners. Some men also admitted when we re-interviewed them to being the main perpetrators rather than the victims of domestic abuse. So one of the examples that I often use, I was sitting in a man's house interviewing, interviewing him about um, the experiences he'd had with his partner. He said, that she'd scratched his face until it bled. That was awful. Can you tell me about what happened before that? I had my hands around her throat. So these were men that purported to be victims, but were actually the main perpetrators, the main instigators of the violence. So when men had experienced the violence, it was often in retaliation or to protect themselves. To get a more comprehensive understanding of who is affected by domestic abuse, according to Marianne Hester, we must consider the prevalence and also the impact. It's only by considering the impact of violence that we're able to understand, understand the effect and the consequences of that behaviour. And what we found was that men were less likely to live in fear of violence against them and it didn't impact upon their daily lives as it does with female victims. In all societies, it's women who've spoken out first about violence against themselves and against their children, both in the home and outside of it. Nell Whiting and I have argued consistently across a number of publications and platforms that Scotland has been unique in that it is women who have been the driving force in defining the issue of domestic abuse, but also in terms of successfully being a motivating factor, challenging it politically, legally, and ideologically. So after the research was finished and we published that, the gender definition, along with other work from, from a lot of the organizations that are represented here today, was consolidated here in Scotland. <coughs> I decided, resolutely, that academia was not for me and I went to live in London. I went to work in a refuge. I worked for Women's Aid for three years. When working at the refuge, I had daily contact with women and their children who were fleeing domestic abuse. At first, I was really idealistic in my views and expectations of both the system and the women 
I wanted them all to escape. I wanted them all to live new lives. However, the daily realities, the financial difficulties, the emotional bonds, and the lack of provision and housing meant that many of these women had no option but to return to abusive relationships. I had to learn to respect the choices that they made. And having children of my own encouraged me to reassess my expectations and presumptions about many of the women at the refuge and the daily realities of their lives. I think back in horror now when I used to turn up at the refuge at nine o'clock in the morning and say, how are you not ready? You and your three kids, we've got an appointment at all last night. <laughs> Horrified by that. <laughs> Also, for me, the relentless and evolving population of the refuge began to normalise the issue of men's violence against women. Although each individual woman and her children personified the issue, this normalisation came from listening to the same narratives told and retold. Different women with the same stories to tell and move on from. Although the refuge was a transitional place and people did move, the abusive, remain, the abusive men remained this perpetual constant. I wanted things to change and I didn't know how to change them. Little did I know that I had my own catalyst that was going to send my life in a different direction. <laughs> in spring 2003, I found out I was pregnant. Unplanned, and I really didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I couldn't afford to look after myself in London, never mind me and the baby. I saw a PhD advertised one lunchtime when I was reading The Guardian at Glasgow Caledonian University. I looked around my dark basement bedsit, and it really didn't take much persuasion to realise that this would offer me and my new baby a way out, a new life. I was invited to interview the week before my due date. They offered me a telephone interview, but stubborn as I was, I wanted to meet the team, I wanted to check out the university, and my mum insisted on coming with me in case I gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> we had a half Guinness on Preston Station on the way back to celebrate. But I was offered the PhD with the insistence that I could choose when I wanted to start. The sheer relief of a new future that was mine to determine is so hard to describe. I gave birth to Dylan the day after. I whispered to him that I had a great life planned for us, and I hoped that this was true. Dylan and I moved to Glasgow in March 2004, and I started my PhD. My studentship was £8,000 a year. As a student, I couldn't access any other benefits. I was shocked, but also grateful to find out that we were entitled to food vouchers amounting to £20 a week. I took on extra teaching to pay for the flat, the food and childcare. I wrote a story about my journey into academia and Grace Polto, who many of you know who died last month, proofread it for me. Where are you in this story, Nancy? Where are the things that you did? She wasn't one to mince her words. The things you overcame. Make sure people know it wasn't easy. Make sure people know that. So that bit was for you, Grace. I'm going to talk about my PhD, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that, that for me were important from there. Um, my, re my PhD was based on two studies. Um, it was based on a study of 89 young people aged 11 and 12 and then I went back to do the research again um, a few years later where I interviewed 120 children but the, what I'm going to talk about today is first based on that first part. The field work took place in primary schools in Glasgow. I used mixed methods, I used exploratory questionnaires, discussion group sessions and vignettes. There were lots of findings, I could talk about my PhD all day, but I'm not going to. But there are two things that I want to pull out today. The first is when I asked people, when I asked the young people to define what violence was, they talked about the real violence. They talked about grown men in public places, physically fighting, with injuries. And then the police would come, someone with authority would come and tell them off and arrest them. So there was a consequence for that behaviour. 
And this idea of real violence was replicated by the boys in schools. So boys would talk about physically fighting with other boys in the playground in a public space where people could see them. One of them would hit another, there'd be a physical injury that could be seen. The teachers would come along, chastise them, tell them that was wrong, and there'd be some kind of intervention and a consequence. to get a detention or a letter home to the parents. What wasn't replicated in this was when the unreal violence, when we talked to, to girls, when girls talked about their experiences. Girls would talk about how their experiences of violence took place in private, where boys would say something, do something, but no one else would see. A teacher wouldn't have seen, so the girl would go and tell the teacher what had happened. The teacher refused to validate that experience. They'd try and shush it up. It's okay, we don't need to talk about that. He's probably doing it because he likes you. There was no validation of her experience. There was no consequence for his behaviour. And so girls learned to normalise, age 11 and 12, those experiences. And that continues through their adult life. The second finding that I wanted to bring up here is how people, young people justified men's violence. How they would talk about obedience and ownership and possession and entitlement and how they would often blame the victim. So as part of the research I used what's known as vignettes. So this is a hypothetical situation which young people could use to then talk about what they might do in that situation. So one of the vignettes focused on Claire and Lee. Claire and Lee have been seeing each other for four months. Claire's favourite outfit is her jeans and her best top. Lee's asked Claire not to wear the best top because he says other boys look at her and he doesn't like this. So I asked the young people to talk about that, to tell me what they thought about that situation. Because they're a couple, she should do what he says. It might upset him if she doesn't do what he's asked. She could just wear a car day and then just wear it when he's not with him. So he won't know. I'd wear the top, but I think if it was really obvious that people were looking at me, then I'd wear a wee jumper. But as long as Claire keeps saying to Lee that she doesn't care, she's going out with him, it doesn't matter what they think, then maybe he <coughs> will feel a bit more reassured. He's the one who's going to be stood beside her when she's out, and he'll look stupid if he's the one that's going out with her and the other boys are looking at her. If you upset Lee, it might drive him away from you. If she wants to be with him, then she shouldn't wear it. She should do what Lee says if she doesn't want him to leave her. He's told her what she should do. It's not fair for her to make Lee feel like that. She shouldn't wear that vest. She's flaunting herself in front of other people. She could be enjoying that lots of boys are looking at her. Just a reminder, these were 11 and 12 year olds. She's revealing herself to the boys. She wants to wear the pink top to expose herself to them. She's got slutty clothes. I was quite shocked by this. And I think what I wanted to do was try and find a way to understand what the young people were talking about. So I thought, sure, you know I'm gonna flip this situation on its head. So Claire and Lee have been seeing each other for four months. Lee's favourite outfit is his jeans and his vest top. Claire has asked Lee not to wear the vest top because she doesn't like it when girls look at him. She doesn't <coughs> like that. <laughs> she can't tell him what to do. She's not the boss of him. She can't tell him what to wear. If he likes them, he can wear it. She's just jealous of other girls looking at him. If she felt secure with him, she wouldn't ask him not to wear it. It's not on. She can't say that. What gives her the right to say that he can't wear his own top?
So this was used time and time again, and I use this example to demonstrate why gender does matter in an analysis of violence. Why all violence is gendered, whether it's violence that's experienced, perpetrated, or witnessed. We live in a society where dominant social constructions of masculinity awards aggression, and femininity is often constructed in opposition to this, in being passive and fearful and dependent. And so this gendered analysis here, and the work that I did with, with Dave Guy for the Scottish Executive, is necessary for us to fully understand the context, the motivations, and the impact of violence upon all involved. And I'm really quite proud of this research, because not only did I manage to speak to 89 young people, because that was no mean feat trying to get through those school gatekeepers, but also the impact that this research has had has been quite monumental. It formed the evidence base for early years guidance for gender equality training. It demonstrated the need for a whole school's approach to both violence and gender equality in terms of how education can be used to challenge attitudes towards gender-based violence. It was also underpinned the gender-friendly nursery awards offered throughout Scotland by the NHS. And I want to say thank you here to Jenny Kemp, who showcased my work when she worked at Zero Tolerance, and also Nell Whiting and Leslie Orr, who helped me to organise a conference, who told me that my research mattered, those findings mattered, and persuaded me to take these findings and run with them. It's important at this point to acknowledge those structural constraints that are relevant, especially for women who are studying, women who are with, within academia. I had three children within my PhD, and one of the reasons that I was able to do that was a man called Bill Hughes. Bill Hughes offered me paid maternity leave when I had my law 17 years ago. Last year, paid maternity leave came in at this university for students. That's a massive difference, that's a massive gap. And I want to acknowledge that help and that support and that scaffolding that I got from individual people. And it's important to recognise that yes, I got my PhD, but there are those individual people that helped me, enabled me to do that. Bill Hughes also paid for childcare at every conference I attended, both during the day and at night. And most importantly at night when that networking goes on, you can drink that wine, you can get to meet people, you can talk to people. That was so significant in my PhD journey. And I think it's really something that we need to, to consider when we're talking about women as students and women within academia. It shouldn't just be down to those individuals. In 2013, I bet you thought I'd lost this picture now, <laughs> a group of us created the Gender-Based Violence Research Network, bringing together practitioners and academics working in the field of violence against women. One of the first tasks of the network was to organise a conference and for me to wear my t-shirt at every opportunity. <laughs> we also created a briefing to defend the continued contested nature of the gender-based definition of domestic abuse. We continued to argue time and time again that gender-based violence was both a cause and a consequence of gender inequalities. We handed this CRFR briefing, pushed ahead by Sarah Morton, to all the MSPs in the Scottish Parliament. It will never cease to amaze me the speed and tenacity of those in the movement, how quickly and efficiently these things can get done, especially in comparison, sorry GCU, but to the grinding gears of university bureaucracy. <laughs> you need the women's movement to take things forward quickly and efficiently. <coughs> I'd like to take a moment to, to celebrate all of those within the women's movement who had a part to play in pushing through the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act that came into effect on the 1st of April 2019. 
The law criminalizes an abusive course of conduct regardless of the presence of physical violence perpetrated by an individual towards a partner or an ex-partner. What a momentous day that was. Not to underestimate the work that had gone into that, but well done, everybody. But as you all know, our work is never done. The recently refreshed Victims Code for Scotland states that victims' interests remain at the heart of our criminal justice system and that victims should feel confident their voices will be heard and they'll be treated with dignity and respect. Despite these improvements in legislation, there remains evidence that although some women find engagement with the criminal justice system to be positive, many do not. In 2021, myself, Katie Proctor and Nell Whiting were commissioned by the Scottish Government to conduct this research. Our research aim was to explore the lived experiences of victim survivors of stalking and or coercive control as they navigate or had previously navigated their way through the criminal justice system. We used a mixed method. So I'd like to say that I did the survey, but Katie did it all. Katie is that numbers person. Katie devised a fantastic survey um, that was sent out on social media and through a lot of the organisations um, here today. Um, we used an introductory video where we recorded ourselves on YouTube talking about the research to kind of humanise ourselves to, to women, to show them who we were, what we were doing, what we were interested in finding out. And a lot of the women that took part, so the reason they took part was because of this video. So I think that's something um, that, that really needs to be um, emphasised there. We also worked in consultation with the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. Um, we used an online survey um, and we also recruited <coughs> women through the survey and asked them to take part in interviews. With the interview, we used what's called a free association narrative method. So these are women who've been through every stage of the criminal justice system. They've been asked questions by the police, by the courts, by support services. Always questions, questions, questions. So we just asked them one. We asked them to tell us about your experience of the Scottish criminal justice system and then we let them construct their narrative. We had 132 women who responded to the survey and 21 participated <coughs> in online interviews. We had age groups ranging from 18 right through to over 75s. And the majority of people, whilst coming from Glasgow, we also covered 29 of the 32 local authority areas. In our study, we found that women invested enormous emotional energy in their engagement with the criminal justice system, including concern for the perpetrator and the criminal justice actors, ongoing caring responsibilities, and performing and managing their emotions at work and in public. They spend practical energy collating evidence, help seeking, and information gathering. All of this can have serious impacts on women's well-being and their mental health. What we found also was that it was more than just this emotional investment in the process and the outcome. There was a hidden practical and emotional labour within the justice system. And for us, this constituted active and measurable work on the part of the women. And we used the work of Hofschild, Liz Kelly and Fiona Vera Gray and we identify what we conceptualised as justice work. This work took the form of managing and displaying the right emotions constantly. It took the form of work of constantly having to protect themselves from perpetrators and protect their children and sometimes wider family members. They had to resource their justice actions. They also had to perform wider administrative and legal work, as well as engage with long-term recovery strategies. The women who want to see their case progress through the, the criminal justice system, they are often required to engage in this justice work. And justice work forms an integral part of their participation. By using this framework, we wanted to highlight how women's labour was both an anticipated yet invisible part of this process. 
All of this justice work takes place within the structures, these gendered regimes of the victim's everyday life and the layered institutions of the criminal justice system. I felt like any chance of going in a way, you have to present it as a fait accompli. You have to give them all the evidence, all the bits, and exactly what they're looking for, and explain it in a way, like you have to do their job for them. The police officer said, you should get a job with us. And I was like, I know, exactly, doing all this work. Time and time again, women told us how they had to do the work of the justice system, how they had to find that evidence, as well as presenting themselves in particular ways. Proctor, Whiting and myself argued that such work should not be deemed necessary in a system where it's the responsibility of the wider role of the criminal justice system to collate evidence against the perpetrator. As such, it meant that women were juggling multiple roles and responsibilities during their criminal justice journeys, many of which added to the stress, the trauma and the disempowerment that they felt. Currently, I'm working with Kate, who's all the way down from Inverness today, on a project that is in collaboration with 15 partners from nine different European countries, aiming to combat and eliminate domestic abuse using modern technological tools and practices. We're only halfway through the project, but one of the things that we're really proud of is how Scotland is leading the way in so much of this work. Whilst we still have a way to go, I think we also need to celebrate the work that Scotland has done and the achievements that we've, been, that, that we've made um, and the women's organisations that have helped to make that happen. I think when I was trying to bring this lecture together, I was thinking about all these different commonalities from the different work that I've done and I've just highlighted three specific projects. Um, but there's other things that I've worked on, that I've been involved in, that I've written about. And I think it's important to remember that domestic abuse is a gender-based crime. And because of that, there are specific elements to those crimes that make them different from other crimes that people experience. This minimisation of charges and the minimisation of people's experiences, right back to those girls in the, in the cloakroom, further compounds that trauma not being believed. Every single project that I've been involved in and every single project that I've read, the people that have written here, talks about the need for improved communication and the listening. Listening and being heard. Women need that improved communication. And the safety of women is paramount at every step of that process. We need to understand the impact of women's experiences, both on them, themselves and the impact on children. And we need to validate those experiences that they've had. And I think that, if anything, is something that I want to, to bring through, through all of the studies. All of these are the commonalities that are significant, that remain significant, and that we need to keep at the fore when we talk about violence against women. I've got a few thank yous that I want to say. I've finished the, the, um, the, the gender-based balance, the, the heavy stuff, but there are people that I want to thank for being here today. I want to say first of all thank you to the unseen people, the people who never get credit for the work that they do. The people that always know the answers that I don't know, and always reply to my emails of, what does that mean? How does this work? What do I do? So Alison Lockhart, thank you. Um, Amanda Bell, Anna Wilson, and everyone, everyone in IT. <laughs> As a woman from a working class background and the first of my family to attend university, I've never taken my role as an academic for granted. I am so thankful to all of those who have supported and encouraged me, and I endeavour to continue throughout my career to repay that to others. As a woman, I've experienced many obstacles, but I've also had very supportive colleagues who have helped me to counter those. 
to those of various institutions I've worked in, Keele, Essex, Napier, CRFR, and here at GCU, I want to say thank you. There's still so much that needs to be done for those in academia across ethnic backgrounds, gender, class, and multiple other intersecting divides that can help us to work towards lasting structural changes. But thank you to my colleagues. To those in the women's movements and organisations that work tirelessly every day, who are always willing to support me with their time, their labour and their ideas, I want to say thank you for helping me but for everything that you do every day. To the victims and survivors who've taken part in the research, who've shared their experiences and helped us to make changes, I want to say thank you. To the women, the supportive, wonderful women I work with every day. Those that are part of the network that I run, the writing retreats that we hold, the cakes that we eat, the seminars we organise, the chats, the rants and the solutions. I want to say thank you to you all. To the researchers that I work alongside, the projects that we've worked on with researchers here, across the city, across the UK and across the world, it is wonderful to work and to research with interesting, inspiring, <coughs> thoughtful people and generous people. And my own work is richer because of all of you. I want to say a special thank you to my PhD students who all inspire me every day with their creativity and their resilience. And all of my students, past and present, even the ones that didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> to my wider family, to Roy's mum, John, and our <coughs> friends, thank you. I also want to say a special thank you to the godfather of coercive control. Evan Stark died yesterday morning, and Anne emailed me and a few of others to, to let us know. And I asked if it was okay to mention this today, um, but I think Evan deserves his own place in this lecture. Um, he's always been incredibly good at supporting. He was very aware that he was a man in a woman's movement. He was very aware of his own power and privilege, but he always made space for us. Um, and I just want to say thank you to, to Evan. <coughs> to my book group, who are here, and my boot campers. I've been with my book group for 17 years. Um, and I love the books and the times we share and the fact that you've reinvigorated my love of reading and for encouraging me to read and to go out and have drinks and to talk about things <laughs> just a little bit. Thank you. To my boot camp buddies, I never would have thought that I would get up four mornings a week at 6 a.m. to run, lift weights and to exercise. I love the endorphins, my renewed love for my amazing and my strong body, and to all of you who spur me on and make me laugh and have a little moan. Thank you. <laughs> to my best friends, I'm very lucky to have three best friends who accept and love me for who I am. They've been a constant in my life, for over 25 years and they've supported me more than they'll ever know. I really struggled with getting some pictures here, Claire. <laughs> Discriminatory there, but um, I want to say thank you. I love you, Claire, Karen and Alison, very much. Thank you. To those who ask me how I do what I do, <laughs> a full-time career and five children, Obviously, I take some of the credit in that. <laughs> I also have this man to thank. Everyone, in my mind, needs a Roy. In the 20 years that we have been together, he has supported me every step of the way. He's always said yes to another baby. <laughs> And his answer for balancing our lives and careers has always been, we can make it work. Thank you for always holding me up and letting me shine. <laughs> and finally, the monthly crew. 
<laughs> you make my life so much brighter and my days so much noisier. <laughs> you five are my everything. You are the catalyst and the reasons for my success. Dylan, my inspiration. Milo, my rock. Autumn, my joy. Stan, my curiosity. And Theo, my wonder. I love you all so very much. shout Wills to come down and I'll just introduce you as I do Wills. <laughs> A lot of my research focuses on violence against women. I was really lucky to get a Global Challenges Fund account um, during Covid. Basically because a lot of the money was given back because no one could travel. So I was really lucky to, to get this money. And I wanted to, to do some research into exploring disability um, during COVID um, and looking at the supportive role that dance can have within that. I'm really honoured to be part of Independence. I was asked to join the Board of Directors back in 2021 and, and I love the job that I have as part of that. Um, for me, Independence have been an amazing organisation that have supported me personally and politically in terms of what they do. Um, I asked Wills to come here today because I think we should finish with a dance. <laughs> it is audience participation. So Stephen, no shirking, you're definitely <laughs> not um, We are going back to the beginning in terms of we're going to dance to Craig Mary. <laughs> we're going to celebrate Tina Turner as a survivor and also Ron Mar Mary um, in terms of the song as well. So I want everyone to stand up. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 